Our top story begins with a look at some of the happenings in the southern part of the continent. And we have journalist Debogo Mukoto, who joins us now from Gaborone in Botswana. Good morning and thank you for joining us. Good morning, Ozoaki. Good morning, Olive. Uh, it's a pleasure to join you guys this morning. It's morning, good to have you this morning. <laughs> All right, now let's get into it. There are reports that South Africa's potential loss of privileged access to the U.S. market under the African Growth and Opportunity Act due to its ties with Russia could result in annual exports worth 60, rand, 60 billion rand being jeopardized. I uh, want to know what are, what are your thoughts about this as well? Well, Olive, I mean, it's, it's, we need to look at it from, from different. It's a multifaceted uh, uh, problem, this one that we are seeing here. Because now, as much as uh, the, the United States is coming to the mix, they've appreciated that Ukraine is fighting for their sovereignty. Yet, when you look at it, the sovereignty is not only compromised by actual open war. Now, when you look at uh, what's happening now in terms of what the U.S., is what the U.S. has done with South Africa. That also on its own undermines and compromise, compromises the, 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 the South African nation's sovereignty in terms of its ability to take uh, autonomous decisions. Now, the, the threat on, on, on its own in terms of really losing this, this trade deal, it's, it's not, it, it might not be as much of a threat as, as it seems if you look at it from the perspective that there's of course there's of course uh, a lot happening on the ground now what we've seen with COVID-19 is that it created a situation where a lot of a lot of us felt threatened but there was a lot of opportunity in that as well South Africa is part of BRICS that's a trade coalition um, South Africa is also Africa as a whole is looking at the AFCFTA that's also another trading avenue so in, in, in South Africa, losing uh, that amount of money, it, it gives South Africa an opportunity to move away from a control structure because what, what, what's now happening is that what's supposed to be for growth and opportunity is now being dangled in, 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 in a way that's saying, okay, if you are not with me, then you are against me. And if you are not, if you are, if you are, if you are against me, then you stand to lose this much. So, you know, that on its own now holds leverage over an entire nation that should be free to choose its allegiances in terms of whether it, it stands with Russia. And we know that South Africa has very close ties with Russia. We've seen it in the past. They've done military training exercises together. The, the BRICS as well is a summit that they're going to be holding jointly come August. And we do know that there's a standing order from the ICC for President Putin to be arrested. I think that's just going to also pour, if I may say, feel or rather bring more of this uh, bilateral relations and, and uh, two allegiances between these three countries into light to really see which allegiance is stronger and which one makes sense for South Africa. I'll speak for South Africa because we are in Africa. I think Africa needs to move towards uh, winning itself or dependence on the West especially when now this dependence compromises our ability to take decisions independently. Right. If we are looking, if, if, if say for South Africa sees opportunity in, 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 in its allegiance with Russia, why are we not able to say, okay, as a, as a power, as an economy, you do have the right to, to choose to, 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 to follow, follow that, uh, that path, uh, looking at your objectives, your interests. Who's to say South Africa's interests are not uh, a priority as compared to the interests of the United States in terms of ge geopolitics? All right, and you know, you know, some people would argue that you know it's it's even a good thing, you know, that a lot of countries across the world are starting to realize how much of a trap they you know get into when they have this over reliance on a relationship with the U.S. or relationship with the uh, trading with the U.S. dollar and some of all of that. Uh, because it puts you in a cage <laughs> where you always have to play by the rules of the United States, um, even when you don't want to, you know. And so there's more and more countries breaking out of that, and I think it's a it's a good thing. Um, the conversation on Russia and, and South Africa and Ukraine, you know, it, it would take too much time. But let's let's get into something else. <laughs> Tim Ogo, I, I think everybody already knows my views on that. Uh, let's go to Lesotho, where a curfew has been implemented. Um, which is aimed at controlling gun violence. This, of course, follows the gunning down of a radio presenter 
in the small southern kingdom uh, nation of Lesotho. Uh, Tabuku, mm -hmm. are guns really so prolific in Lesotho? And is the curfew not maybe drastic in this case? Is there some other way that this could maybe hand handled? Yeah, well, you know, it's 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 what we what we found out because I've been communicating with uh, our fellow journalists in Lesotho as well. You know, a lot of people uh, on the ground feel that curfew is drastic, and uh, I asked a question. I posed a question to say, okay, in terms of gun violence, what statistics or what scientific research points to it happening between ten and four a.m. What logic went into that? Is there research to say most cases or most gun violent, gun gun um, related violence took place within those time frames? And there's no scientific research or statistics or cases from the police that point to that being the case. Now, everybody on the ground feels like a curfew obviously is going to pinch on the economy. So it's 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 been viewed as very drastic for the fact that it's not based on anything that can be scientifically or statistically proven. Now, in terms of guns being prolific in Lesotho, what uh, we're getting is that uh, guns are moving from, unlicensed, unlicensed guns are moving from uh, officials or security officials to civilians. So now what's happening in Lesotho is that you find that gender-based violence now involves guns more than ever. Uh, thieves or criminals now have access to guns more than ever. We've seen the same thing take effect in Botswana, where most of our most of our crimes involve guns. Unlike before, where it used to be a knife, where it used to be something less, you know, a, a little less more harmful than or threatening than a gun. Now we have guns in in society. And now, when it comes to the shooting of the journalist as well. Uh, I've been uh, I've been um, informed that um, the problem now in Lesotho is that they don't have a media policy. So with this particular journalist, they they, they he had uh, aligned himself politically to, to to a certain party, and now what he has been doing is that he's been poking at the national security services, poking at certain political um, leadership in the country. So the shooting could also be politically motivated. Or, or as 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 journalists in the Soto have revealed, the findings are pointing to. So you find that uh, it's 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 a very it's 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 a dicey situation where you are trying to fix a problem with with um, with a solution that doesn't fit. But the government has said the curfew will serve to give them time to think strategically on a solution. But it's quite drastic for us. Drastic. I don't know if drastic is the right word in this case because, I mean, one might uh, assume that that might in some way, don't, don't you think that that might be downplaying the fact that a life was actually lost? And maybe, you know, they might have some intel that we do not have. Don't you think, don't you see that from that perspective? Well, it, from that perspective, it also makes sense. A life has been lost. Um, and, and obviously, um, we've seen the same thing happen in Swaziland where you get journalists and, and uh, people who drive to send getting attacked. But at the same time, we're pointing to the fact that um, in the same instance, um, this particular journalist had been involved in cases that can be uh, investigated independently, as opposed to taking the whole entire nation and compromising its, its, its economic standing. Lesotho is not doing so well economically. So now when you impose curfew, you see what curfews do during COVID-19, where businesses have actually collapsed, um, where societal uh, society's standard of living has actually collapsed. And we're seeing high inflation right now. So when you balance it against the economics of it and uh, balancing it off against a case that can be investigated independently, to actually get to the core of what's going on, it, it, it sort of it sort of looks slightly drastic. All right. Okay, let's take the mm -hmm. conversation away to Botswana where they're gearing up for the 2024 election year. And as can you imagine, there's certain movement from 
both you know the ruling party and the opposition parties as well now there's been a big move this week that was uh, that of a former high court judge and former minister of foreign affairs human rights activist and lawyer who held a press conference announcing her resignation from the bdp um Tebogo, could you speak to the instability maybe or lack of it in the ruling party what what currently is your um, analysis of what's going on yeah olive um this 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 press conference uh you know really uh, took the country by storm. I think a lot of Botswana were looking at it to say, wow, uh, we're profusely shocked. Because like like uh, we've, we've noted, or like it stands right now, may you, Dr. Unity Dow is somebody of very high regard. She stands for women's rights. She, she she's, a, she's a former high court judge. She's held different portfolios that really give her that weight and that credibility. So now she has resigned pointing to intimidation within uh, the ruling party. She's pointed to a stifling of dissent. She said um, in, within the structures of the ruling party, she's unable to speak um, on issues without bias. She's unable to address issues and fix things without uh, them becoming too political. So I think she's, she's reached a point, a boiling point where she felt that she cannot go on anymore. And um, speaking to intimidation, um, women representation in politics has also been one thing in Africa that has been an issue. And more often than not, you'd find women who are in political spheres uh, uh, within African parties, the ruling BDP as well, pointing to that kind of intimidation where, okay, you are a woman, keep quiet here, don't, you know, so it's, it's, it's those aspects of her resignation that has actually uh, uh, left everybody thinking, yeah, we might have a serious problem in terms of equality here. Now, in terms of also the 2024 election, for a ruling party to use uh, such a high profile figure, it, it, it also really just um, doesn't sit well because we have to ask ourselves now if, if somebody of that high regard loses confidence in the governance of, of, a, of a standing administration, you know, what, what does that say about the party and what does that say about us voting in, 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 in 2024? So that's that's things as they stand now and, and we're, we're looking at how it goes down because apparently she's been called in for, for a hearing uh, on the 24th of, of, of May. So we're looking to see how it's all going to play out and how it's going to eventually uh, impact the 2024 elections. Well, there's so much going on, you know, with regards to elections uh, in 2024. Here in, in many African countries, are, uh, you know, are of course, uh, running elections. Um, but I think, you know, all of this, you know, is still part of the fine-tuning of the electoral process and the leadership recruitment process in different parts of the continent. So we'll see how it turns out. But let's go to Zimbabwe now. It, it's not, you know, any news that it's the economy has been in turmoil for decades. Uh, we've seen the impacts mm -hmm. of this instability impact the rest of Southern Africa in, in various ways. Uh, faced with, uh, with uh, of course, staggering debt, an estimated eight billion U.S. dollars, and a collapsed economy. Now, tell us what exactly mm -hmm. is happening here. Especially, Zimbabwe used to be one of Southern Africa's most powerful economies. Um, is this mm -hmm. just the effect of sanctions, or has there also been, you know, mismanagement, you know, of the economy over over decades? I think I think Osagi, uh, to, 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 to put it mild mildly, uh, it, it's, it's it's yeah mismanagement. But mostly you'd understand that we have a serious problem when it comes to corruption in Africa, and it's at the core of everything we touch, where we lose uh, billions of, of currency into into thin air or into individuals' pockets. So I think this has played into what we've seen evolve in in Zimbabwe. The sanctions, I, I was talking to the European Union ambassador recently um, to really ask her because our, our foreign minister had called the European Union out to say, you know what, um, lift sanctions because these sanctions are, are, are vicariously affecting the, the rest of us, they're affecting Botswana, they're affecting South Africa. Lift the sanctions on Zimbabwe so that the Southern African region can, can, can uh, see better economic uh, results. But she has said, we, we don't, we, as the EU, we have not imposed sanctions that are so crippling. The sanctions that we have, if you may call them sanctions, are targeted at individuals 
that uh, have 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 uh, worked to actually drive maladministration, like you're saying, and mismanagement within that particular nation. So I think it, 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 it's, it's both. You have both playing into it. The mismanagement of funds by, South, by African leaders in general, and then also the sanctions by, by Western powers to try and mitigate the situation, but not realizing that it's also contributed to crippling that particular economy. Now, there's a bit of hope um, in, in us talking about this. We do know, of course, that the economy has been down for years, but there's a bit of hope in that the African Development Bank, Akinomi uh, Adesina, is, is actually championing to, 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 to get uh, Zimbabwe out of, of the mess that it's in right now by maybe trying to compensate farmers that uh, Robert Mugabe asked in, 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 in the early 2000s, as, as I'm sure you are aware. So they're trying to really uh, free up funds to help Zimbabwe establish points in the economy where it can actually start to claw its way back to, 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 uh, to, to some, some sort of normalcy when it comes to that economy. Right. So yeah. we, we've seen President Emerson Mnangawa also commit to that. So well, there's hope. There's hope there. And um, as, as the Southern African uh, region, we're actually looking at it to see how it goes and whether it will actually be implemented correctly. Tebogo, thank you so much for a wonderful analysis of some of the biggest stories in Southern Africa. And I'd love for us to speak about Julius Malema and the current drama going on, but that's a conversation for another day. We hope that when we have you next week, we might be able to touch on that as well. Thank you very much and have a wonderful weekend. Absolutely. It's been a pleasure. Cheers to Osagi. Cheers to you all. Enjoy yourselves. Thank you. Too. you.